I call this meeting of the Denport Community School District Board of Directors to order. We'll start with our board priorities. Uh, Director Hayes, would you read those for us, please? Yes, I'll be happy to do so. The Davenport School Board establishes the following priorities to ensure the academic success of all students, provide leadership and direction to improve the overall learning environment in our classrooms, schools, and district, including the health, safety, security, and happiness of students and staff, direct and support action programs and activities which reduce the impact of poverty on our students, their families, and our community. Thank you very much. And uh, how about Director Beck, would you read our mission and vision statement, please? Sure. Mission statement. Okay. Enhance each student's abilities by providing a quality education enriched by our diverse community. And the vision statement. Education that challenges conventional thinking, prepares all students to compete in a global society, and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you very much. Uh, Director Gosa, I think, is out of town, but will be participating by phone later on. Um, so I'm not sure, Mary, when we'll get him in here. Probably after the uh, showcase sometime. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the presentation. Superintendent Tate. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We have a very strong group called the Network for Community School Partnerships. It's managed by John Border, meets every month, and I asked John to come and make a presentation to the board to talk about his composition and what they do and the effectiveness. So, John? Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. I'm John Border. I work for the Davenport Community Schools as a community education specialist. Uh, here at the ASC. I uh, have with me this evening Jennifer Best from Iowa State University Scott County Extension Office. She is the chair of the uh, Network for Community and School Partnerships and she'll be uh, introduced in just a moment. The, uh, you know, it is a wonderful and empowering thing when you can be, feel connected to a mission. And in, in our school district we have the mission of enhancing each student's abilities by providing a quality education enriched by our diverse community. And that's where I feel the connection in the work that we do through NCSP, and it's a, it's a wonderful feeling, so I'd like to share that with you tonight. Uh, the Network for Community School Partnerships is a long-standing group, about three decades of history behind it right now. Uh, but currently, we have uh, 88 individuals that are a member of that group. Uh, about 40 community and faith-based organizations are represented. We meet on a monthly basis, either the third or fourth week, uh, Wednesday uh, of each month from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. here in the boardroom. Uh, the agenda is pretty much the same every month in structure, but different content. We uh, open the session with a little sharing time. We might have anywhere from 20 to 30 uh, organizations and individuals represented that uh, morning. And we take the time for each of them to be able to share any uh, current events, happenings, uh, celebrations or concerns that they're having within their organizations. From there we go into a presentation phase that usually lasts anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, so far this year we've had uh, three meetings of NCSP in August, September and October. In August we discussed hunger, nutrition and its impact on learning. Uh, our guests that morning were Mike Miller from the Riverbend Food Bank and Ken Heinen from our Food Nutrition Services Department. Uh, in September, we invited uh, Director Schneckloth and his team uh, to present to us on the broad scope of learning supports available. Uh, we feel like that's a very powerful role for them to play. In addition to those Wednesday mornings, they attend those special meetings as well. And in addition to the monthly meetings, we also have uh, any time opportunity for organizations to share through my office uh, updates, information, events, that I can then share out with the broader network uh, via email. You know, I said it's a wonderful thing to be connected to a mission. 
And I guess if I were to try to capture our purpose uh, as a group, I would say that we attempt to strengthen community engagement with the schools to improve and enrich student achievement. With this group, it is a specific focus, though, on eliminating or mitigating barriers to learning. If you look at our roster of organizations that are members, we have a lot of groups like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, Family Resources, on and on. Their role in the community really is to provide those supports and to help eliminate the barriers that kids face on a day-to-day -day basis uh, on their way to school and at home. The way that we do that is by mobilizing community resources to address identified barriers to learning and through the facilitation of expanded opportunities through communication, coordination, cooperation, collaboration, all levels. We also have a number of principles that we kind of feel are bedrocks, uh, real strong foundations for the work that we do. We believe in institutional responsiveness. Uh, we don't try to delay. We are, we are here to serve the schools and, and, the, and the larger community good. We believe in the efficient use of resources. So when we, when we meet and we have those sharing sessions, it gives us an opportunity to align physical resources, financial resources, sometimes human resources, to reduce the amount of duplication in our community. We believe in the integrated service delivery to be able to expand access and availability of needed services. I'm really excited about what's happening over at the J.B. Young Opportunity Center, for example. Uh, we are having our open house tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Of course, you're all invited to attend. But that will be an example of integrating the delivery of services in one place. So it's this idea of people, place, and program all together. That's where the good things happen. And then, of course, we believe in lifelong learning. Uh, a colleague of mine refers to it as twinkle to wrinkle. We're all lifelong learners, and we all have those opportunities at various points in our life uh, to learn more and uh, be able to pass that on to, uh, to the community. We're here also to serve as a tool of outreach. So we are here to provide support and act as a resource group for you for the superintendent's office, to our district administration, and to our schools. We'd like to be able to put ourselves in a position to assist our schools with partnerships that promote meaningful family and community engagement. And we're also here to serve as a point of contact for our schools, for community and faith-based organizations that support youth and families. So it's a conduit of sorts. I'd like to introduce you now to Jennifer Best uh, with Iowa State University uh, Scott County Extension Office. She's a true and steadfast partner to our district in a number of ways, but my personal preferred way that she supports this is by chairing this, this group, and, and she's got a few remarks for you. Thank you, John. Always happy to be here. I have spent most of my career here in Scott County collaborating with Davenport Schools, and I've learned a lot of things. Um, I've learned much more than I think I've given back. Uh, one of the things that I have learned is that Davenport Schools has highly qualified teachers. We've got well-maintained facilities, up-to-date technology, rigorous, relevant curriculum, enriching extracurricular activities, and yet those things alone cannot address the challenges that we face. Um, those are things that don't happen inside the classroom. Those are things that happen in uh, homes and in our communities. And so society might expect schools to solve all of our social problems, but at the network of community and school partnerships, we know that that's not fair and that's not realistic. It's not realistic for schools to be able to do that. Um, and so we know that our community has a responsibility to the whole child, and that means that we have to work together in order to address what those barriers are. Um, we are obligated to address those challenges as a community because if we don't, we will never be able to celebrate the potential that our young people in our community have. And so every month and throughout the month, our um, community works together, um, both at the meeting but all throughout the rest of the month, talking about what are the needs, what are the issues, how can we collaborate better, how can we um, continuously improve our process. 
And so um, we do kind of three things um, that I, I think are really significant in NCSP. One is to support each other because we have shared responsibility. Um, the people around that table every month truly believe um, it's not, the school district cannot do it by itself. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't need those kinds of things. And our agencies can't do it ourselves either. We absolutely have to work together. The challenges are, are too great um, to be able to do them alone. And so collaboration is absolutely the name of the game. And um, we do that sort of big picture at those meetings, but all throughout the month we are on various committees and sending emails and working together on different training opportunities and you know what's going on in buildings that can really help us work together to achieve common goals. Um, I think the third thing that is really significant is advocacy. Um, there's kind of um, sort of the big picture of advocating for the value of public education and what that does in a democratic society. Um, however, we also um, take really seriously the role of understanding what's actually going on within school systems, all the way from financial issues to particular policies and programs and making sure that the real information is what is shared. Um, among our agencies and also with families. Um, sometimes families have to hear things from a variety of people in a variety of ways uh, for them to um, really understand what it is that's going on and so we take that role very seriously. Um, and then we also really love to celebrate. Um, we talk about uh, being engaged ambassadors uh, for the school district. What is it that we can do to really celebrate all of the really amazing things um, that go on every single day? It's very easy for us to get caught up in challenges and barriers and we do spend lots of time on those things because that's how we can get kids in the seats in school and learning however um, lots of unique things that don't happen anywhere else um, happen in Davenport schools and so um, part of what we also do is to listen and engage and celebrate um, so that those are messages that we get out as well um, it's a very unique group. It's a very diverse group. We address a lot of different kinds of issues. Um, and one of the things that I always say um, when we do uh, come before the board, but also when I just talk about the group in the community, is that um, Davenport, is, Davenport Schools is unique in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that they're very unique is that um, there is a level of transparency and a level of um, value for asking how can we work together um, let's do this together that I don't see often um, in other school districts. And so um, it's always such a pleasure and a privilege to um, acknowledge um, that we can get things done here in a way that I have, I have not been engaged in in other ways. Um, and NCSP is sort of the, the mechanism and the venue that we come to do that. Um, so John and I'd be happy to take any questions that any of you have. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from the board? Director DeSalvo. Really good information that you shared and, and the things that you're doing in the community are fantastic in this list of, of the master list of connections or people. That was amazing. I'm gonna hold that list. And <laughs> but you talked a lot about families and, and intervention. How, how do you reach out to them? How do you get them to engage? I think that there's a couple of different um, things that are important and it all comes down to relationships. Um, we have to have relationships with buildings, uh, with teachers, with paraeducators, school counselors, school-based therapists, administrators. Um, those relationships allow us to build the trust and the rapport that allow us to access the families. But it also goes the other way around. Um, often we have um, interfaces with families outside of the school system and when families are talking about their needs and their frustrations or how they don't understand um, maybe what's going on with their student or um, they're in need of help and they don't know how to access those things then it's coming the other direction. Um, so it's really a really organic process. Um, I wouldn't say there's a lot of system to it. I mean we certainly use virtual backpack and you know all of those kinds of procedures that are very important um, but I think everybody around the table at NCSP would say ultimately one thing is what gets the work done and it's relationships. I would just add to that that a couple of the ways that, that happen you gotta meet people where they are you've got to you've got to literally sometimes physically meet people where they are 
Now, we've got limited capacity to do that with personnel, but when you take a, a, an account for 90 organizations that have staff that are ready to meet people where they are, that makes it a much more powerful experience. Some people are at the most fundamental level. They just want to know how can I help my child do well, do better in school? How can I keep my child in school? Others are a place where they might be ready to even volunteer. You know, so we have a good, strong, robust volunteer program. So there are many ways, and the, the, the outreach that those 90 groups is able to provide is irreplaceable. Anything else, Director Hayes? I don't have a question, but Jen, I want to thank you for all that you do. You're in so many different things, and your willingness to chair this particular program. It just shows your commitment to the district, and thank you. Anything else? Okay, I have just a couple of quick things. Um, I think, Jen, it's it's always a pleasure to have you here. I, it's been so long, I think, since you've been here. But I also, I learn from you a ton whenever you do talk. Um, this is all really, really cool stuff. And, but you said, in fact, John, you used a couple of, of uh, sets of words. Some of them started with C, like cooperation, collaboration, and you had two others. Do you know what? Communication and collaboration. Communication. Right. Coordination. Collaborate, coordination. Okay. Cooperation. Okay. And collaboration. All right. And then you had another one where you were using, oh, people, places, and programs. Right. So appreciate those thoughts. Um, and then, Jen, in your presentation, you talked about the community. And I was wondering, what is the community? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I suppose it depends on who you ask. But I can tell you from NCSP, it would be anybody who lives, works, serves, plays in Davenport. That's kind of how we would say it. Okay. Um, some of us live here. Some of us, like my son, goes to school here. And many, many people, that would be the case. Some of us are working here. Um, some of us, are, are, their businesses are here or their faith-based organizations are here. And we're only doing as well as our kids are doing. And so if we don't put that commitment there, that means it's everybody's community. So, and that's kind of where I was thinking, because there, there are a lot of um, issues that we all deal with. And I was thinking about your altruism and trying to in, intuit where you were. And because I'm thinking about the needs across the state of Iowa. So when you think of students in our community, do you kind of extrapolate that thinking out to the state or especially if you're part of the extension, or are we looking really at just us? Yeah, I, I think that there are common elemental issues, fundamental foundational issues that Davenport experiences that everybody is struggling with. Um, being part of a statewide and a national network, um, for better or for worse, I get to see some of those things. However, there are also some things that are fairly unique uh, within Davenport, both positive and negative. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, one of the things that a lot of our partners are able to do is take the lessons we've learned from other communities when we travel at conferences and when we um, go to state meetings and those kinds of things and say, oh, that worked really well there. What does that mean for us in this community? But I can tell you we do an awful lot of talking about what goes on in Davenport. Um, every single month I am getting, sometimes multiple times a month, I get phone calls and emails that I heard this and this is going on in Davenport that you're involved in. How did you guys do that? Um, so I think Davenport's more famous than we think we are um, in terms of getting things done. I know sometimes it feels like all we're doing is addressing problems, but I can tell you people across the state are watching um, and say, how in the world did they get that particular thing done? I had a, a phone call from a woman at a public health department in Texas last month who went to a conference with a physician that, was, that is practices here in Davenport and heard about something that we were doing, and she called me. And she said, how in the world did you get your school district to? And blah, blah, blah. And I said, I didn't. That's really what they value, that this is really who they are as a community. And it just felt so good to be able to say, nobody had to talk anybody into anything. We just believe that way here. Um, 
and that it's fun it's always fun to do that all right well thank you both thank you john and thank you jen great thank presentation you. great work thanks a lot thank you We'll move on to uh, showcase superintendent tate uh, thank you very much we have jackson elementary school tonight their principal is in des moines for training and so we have nicole that's going to take the whole show under her aegis and get moving thank you good evening board members and guests i'm nicole willard the jackson elementary teacher librarian and tonight we will feature our family involvement liaison mr jared connor and a group of our fifth grade students. We will begin with Mr. Connor sharing information about our Title I family reading events, and then our fifth grade students will present to you tonight. So, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for allowing the Jackson family to come up here and present. They're very excited, as you can see. Um, and first, yeah, as she said, I'm the Family Involvement Liaison with Jackson. Uh, my name is Jared Connor. And I just wanted to show you guys a quick video about uh, our uh, Title I. It was actually a math event this last month, but it's either math or reading. Uh, we like to come up with activities that all the children can do together and with the teachers and the parents and try to make learning fun and uh, get everybody involved. So here's the video. <laughs> Jackson Elementary took a study trip to the Buffalo Elementary STEAM Lab. At Jackson, we will be expanding our Art Basics program into a STEAM Lab. A few of us fifth graders created a short movie trailer for you to view highlighting our trip. We also brought some of our finished planet projects for you to view. Afterward, we are willing to answer any questions you might have for us. Thank you for your time, and we, are wel we welcome your feedback.
Is there any more? That's it for our presentation. We're just waiting for, we, they handed out some things that they did uh -huh. on their visit that you okay. can look at and then a few questions for okay. the students about what they. All right. Well, it looks like uh, it'll take a little while to, for all of that to get through, but is there, are there any comments or questions from the board? Right. Director Hayes. Um, could you all tell us your names? My name's Sierra. My name is Emily. My name is Ashley. My name is Phoenix Hughes. My name is Julie. Thank you very much. Now I notice up here you had some like goggle things on. What were you looking at? So the, it's called virtual reality where you basically get like to experience like stuff like in like 3D where you can look around and it's like all there. Like it's like you get to see you get to see stuff like up close. Like you actually get to see stuff but it's not like very far away, it's really up close. Was it like different items or yeah. were you looking at a particular item? Yeah, the solar yeah. system. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Everybody jump in, that's okay. We wouldn't know without it. Hey, would one of you pull the microphone down a little bit so we can hear you a little better? Pull it down to where you're gonna, a little bit more, a little more. There you go, that's good. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any other, Director DeSalvo? What was your favorite part about the STEAM lab? My favorite part was um, doing the VR because it's like so like, it's like like you're doing it in real life. Right. Like, Anybody else? My favorite part was the virtual reality headset because you can just go anywhere you want and I decided to go inside the sun. Nice. <laughs> My favorite part was the VR headset and it was funny because when you looked down, it felt like you were going to fall. <laughs> My favorite part was when we did the comic life and we got to like okay. make like do like one of the planets and like put facts about them in pictures. Nice. My favorite part was um, using the programs you could use like Kodu and Comic Life. And I love you all did this video that we just got to watch. Mm -hmm. Really impressive. That's awesome. Keep doing that stuff. There's so. two other people that did it with us, but they're not here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you did a really good job on it. I'm glad you're going out and making field trips. That's an awesome field trip to take. So good luck with your lab. I hope it goes really well. And when it's done, I want to know because I want to come see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't, be, don't, don't be leaving. Uh, Director Hayes. In looking at these sheets, everyone enjoyed Kodo. What is that? Um, Kodo is basically where you get to make your own planet and um, just put anything you want on it. You can put water on it, trees on it, mountains on it. Like you can build anything. Yeah, you can put, you can have like a dice planet because they had little dice blocks. Um, an ice planet, or just create a n normal planet from the solar system. And it's pretty fun because, like, you know, none of them's going to be the same because we all get our separate code that we have to code. That's why it's called code you. Um, you have to code your rover or your. I don't know what it's called. It's something else that, like, <laughs> flies up in the air. <laughs> Oh, it's called a robot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I saw that on practically every one of those sheets. That, every, that was your favorite part, which you enjoy most. So thank you for explaining it. Anybody else? Oh, before, before the board has anything, some of <coughs> our student board members, uh, this is your first time meeting uh, at a board meeting, and I wanted to make sure that you felt welcome to participate in these discussions. If, there's, if there are questions or comments that you have as well, get my attention so that you can participate as well. Okay? Um, any other board? Uh, Director Beck. 
So now that you guys have visited a STEAM lab and you'd like to make one or build one at your school, what is the first thing that you would like to see put into your school's STEAM lab? Um, we would like the, the chairs and the VR. <laughs> what was special about the chairs? Um, they, <laughs> they were like, you got to on rock around and you got to rock around. It's like a fidget chair, kind of. Yeah. Okay. And okay. then, cool. also, Kodu. Uh-huh. So you could code, so you can do more coding? Yes. Yeah. Is that, can you only do planets with that, or can you code whatever um, you want? You can, build you can do anything you want. Okay. They also have these really cool computers there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else? Um, all of you are smiling. You were smiling the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Like like you're really having fun. And I thought, wow, I wish I was back there th now. Because um, do, you, do you all really enjoy school? Not just this. Do you just enjoy learning and all this cool stuff, or where are you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay. It's really it's it's inspirational to me that you all enjoy learning because you are our future. You really are, and we need you, and we need you to be thinking big and doing these cool things. And so thanks, and thanks for your presentation. Thanks for your video. Oh, hang on, Director Mayfield. I'm just curious. I can't n but notice the pink. What is the school color? It's actually red. Oh, yeah, is it red? red? Okay. Well, is that just by circumstance, just by chance that you're dressed in that color? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that shows me some togetherness, that yeah. you, you think somewhat alike, don't you? He's the, he's the odd one out. Well, that's okay. He's coming along. Okay. Yeah. Ladies are leading. I understand. Thank you. Great presentation. Okay. Thank you all. Very good. Okay, we'll move on to student board reports. Superintendent Tate. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's great to have representatives of uh, three of our high schools here tonight. And Connor, we'll start with you. And move down the table <clears throat> so, so still our big event at central is our hunger drive and a, a couple of fridays ago okay um i and another student council member went to mckinley to talk to them about how they can raise cans and what we did was we kind of explained a little bit of what the hunger drive does why we do it and to help kick off their red ribbon week um one of the things that we're doing to try to get the elementaries involved is we invited them to a movie night in our new auditorium where they will be showing Moana and watching all of their hands shoot up as one of our kids asked if they had ever seen that movie. Um, I don't think there wasn't a hand that was raised, so that was kind of cool. Um, we took one of North's ideas was Stop the Bop, and we will be starting that tomorrow, which um, to stop the song Blue, I don't know if you guys have ever heard it, but yes, it is very annoying. Um, it'll play during the over the intercom during passing time, and to stop it, you um, we have to collect 100 boxes of food. So um, tomorrow we have our hunger drive odd fundraiser, where we had um, our fundraiser that we did. It will finally come to fruition, where the teachers that we had, who were possibly going to be taped to the wall, um, if they didn't win that they get pied in the face at the odd by some of the student council members and I myself will be pied in the face because my old physics teacher paid 50 bucks to pie me in the face <laughs> so that that's happening I can't believe I did that and um, at the odd we're gonna have um, basically a class competition where between graduating classes where there'll be games that'll be played where volunteers can play life-size hungry hungry hippos with those scooters you would ride in elementary school, laundry baskets, and you push each other around. There's a pie eating contest and um, pantyhose bowling, which is where you stick a pantyhose over your head with a tennis ball at the end of it and try to swing your body back and forth to try to knock over a Gatorade ball bottle. And um, Wednesday, I don't know if you guys know Mr. Harkness, but he's a social studies teacher at Central. He ended up collecting the most money from the students and will be taped to the wall during all four lunches on Wednesday. So he's going to have a great time with that. Um, 
Our football team is a part of the final 16 teams in the state for the first time since, I believe, 1988. And if we beat North Scott, we will play the winner of Pleasant Valley and Bettendorf. And our choir also had 11 people qualify for the 600-member All-State Choir Team. Go ahead, Katie. Director Gosa, can you hear us? Yep. All right, so North is getting their food hunger drive underway as well. So we had our kickoff odd a few weeks ago. We just finished our Stop the Bop. We fundraised $250 in three days. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, this Wednesday, we have a fundraiser. It's a fun night for students and their families with a trivia night and a movie night following. So just kind of get everyone involved in that. Um, different clubs, community and organizations on school are going to be leading different games for the students to play to raise money and cans for the food drive. Uh, as far as our sports teams, our football team finished the season with three wins, which I think is the most since the year 2000. It's positive. Uh, we fin the boys team finished sixth in, in their district for cross country. And our very own Zach Shocker from North got placed ninth in that race, which qualifies him for the state meet, which is this Saturday in Fort Dodge. Um, the girls swim meet districts is on Saturday so we have eight varsity swimmers which is really nice their team's grown like exponentially since the past four years um, so we're excited about that that's uh, all for about what's happening at North today um, I'll start off with the uh, cross country because I'm the cross country captain so uh <laughs> West uh, placed fifth at our districts um, last Thursday, and I placed seventh. So this will be my third state trip. So I'm looking to make all state this year. So it's top 15 in the state. So. Uh, a couple of other things that are happening. Um, we are also kicking off our hunger drive. That's going to happen sometime this week. And then for swimming districts, um, West is also sending a varsity team to swimming districts on Saturday, and then. We have uh, one diver who's currently ranked 17th in the state who will be diving at Districts at Central on Thursday, and you guys are welcome to come out to that. Um, and then a couple of other things that Shane's going to talk about. Um, a couple of other things that have happened at West. Uh, all state auditions happened last Saturday. We had four students that were accepted in the band. Um, sophomore Caitlin Bauer on the flute, sophomore Michaela Sperry on French horn, Kirsten Cayley, who is a senior on clarinet, this is her second year as being selected as one of the top in the district, and myself on percussion, and I made it for the second year, still holding my stop, uh, spot as the top percussionist in the district. Um, two students were also picked as alternates, senior Sophia Buckley on alto saxophone and junior William Zog on tenor sax. Um, we also had another percussionist, Carson Cayley, who is a junior. He was recalled, but unfortunately he was not accepted. Um, the West Coral program also had one person that was accepted for the first time in seven years, I believe is what I was told. Um, that would be junior Brady Pratt. He's a tenor two, so that was definitely a very big moment on Saturday. And we are also going to have uh, our West Drama Department do our annual play on uh, November 4th and 5th in West's auditorium. This year's selection is Arsenic and Old Lace, which is a dark comedy written by Joseph Kesselring. And then I believe that concludes West. Oh. Um, our coach actually was uh, Mac Coach of the Year, so it's very surprising. We were very happy for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, students. That was a great report. Uh, that's the sort of things we like to hear the, that we might not read in the newspaper or, or know about, so we really appreciate you digging and bringing it to us tonight. Thank you very much. We'll move on to board reports. Are there any? Director Hayes. The band spectacular last Tuesday, Monday, 
was exactly that spectacular. So all of you all that participated in it, awesome job. I'm not one to sit outside, but I loved it. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. You did a great job. And also, I'm still challenging all of my fellow peers here to come over to the food pantry. Poverty is one of our issues here, and to see it in action is so rewarding. Those four hours go so fast. So looking forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you very much. Uh, Director DeSalvo. I think um, since we last met, we had our legislative um, ice cream social event. It was very spirited and educational and informative, and we will be having a committee meeting as soon as I can get one scheduled, but I'm trying to work around poor Madison's schedule, which is a nightmare, but we'll get there. So, Okay, so after Saturday, I'm good. So anyway, um, we had our first little event, and it was good, I think, thanks to Mary for all the things that she did to make that happen. Thank you. Any other board reports? Okay, I've got two. Um, last week, <coughs> there was a forum at the Figgy on open government, and it was sponsored I, or hosted by the Quad City Times. Um, and our superintendent, Tate, was one of the uh, stars in the uh, different skits that they presented there. And, and he, along with several others, just did an outstanding job. Um, something else that happened to me a couple weeks ago, and I forgot to mention it at the last board meeting. Um, and this is something that uh, some of the students at West are doing. And it's, it's at least associated with the combustible lemons. And it may be, but there may be other groups. I think that you have at least two robotics teams over there. I don't quite understand it. Of the different type, there are multiple kinds of robotics teams that we have. I believe we have six teams. So, oh, yeah. okay. All right. Well, anyway, and I want to be very, very careful in the way that I say this uh, because I got a piece of paper. I got two pieces of paper on my porch, and I thought it was just sales literature. Um, but it says, you've been flocked. F. F L O C K E D, and <coughs> and what that is is uh, some of the students as a fundraiser, they put uh, pink flamingos in your yard, and it is it's really funny, and it 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 makes you smile, and then people go by and they go, oh, he got flocked, you know, and uh, it's a lot of fun and. And I just wanted to acknowledge it and to recommend that people consider that. It's a fundraiser that, of course, all these uh, help all of our students, but another great way to help our students. But I want to say thank you to whoever did that to me. Um, well, I guess, anyway, I want to thank, uh, thank whoever did that, and I wanted to thank the... Uh, the school and the students for everything they're doing there. Um, okay, with that we'll move on to. Oh, Director De Salvo. Apologize, I forgot. There's one more thing. I have a particular person that I know at the University of Iowa, who happened to mention to the president of the university one day. Just and I don't know why they were talking, but they were talking about the issues that that the state is having with funding, in particular Davenport Community Schools. And now this particular Iowa Hawkeye student has taken it to the collegiate level and they've created a group up there with A.J. Smith and my son. So they'll be getting a hold of you, huh? Because we've got our work cut out and we are growing. So it's tonight, in fact, he's meeting with the president of the student council at the University of Iowa. That's pretty exciting stuff. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we'll move on to uh, communications and upcoming events. Director Potts, would you read all of those for us, please? 
I, I apologize if I caught you off guard. <laughs> Ribbon House. Um, October 24th, 530. The Local School Improvement Advisory Committee will meet in the Jim Hester Boardroom. November 6th at 5.30, the Committee of the Whole will be meeting in the Jim Hester Boardroom. November 10th is a holiday. The school district is closed. November 13th, 6 p.m. is the regular meeting in the boardroom. November 15th, Wednesday, the Urban Education Network meeting is in the downtown Marriott in Des Moines. November 16th, Thursday, the Iowa Association of School Boards annual meeting is at the Iowa Events Center in Des Moines. November 23rd and 24th is a holiday, so we're closed. November 27th, 6 o'clock, is the regular board meeting here in the boardroom. And November 28th, 7.30, is the holiday concert at the Adler Theater. Thank you very much. Next is Open Forum. <clears throat> open Forum is a time for members of the community to give input at a board meeting regarding school district issues or concerns. Individuals who want to speak should fill out an open forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to open forum. The board will not act on any issue presented during open forum if it was not published as an agenda item. The Iowa Open Meetings Law prohibits action on any issue that is not on the agenda. The president will set the amount of time allowed for individuals to speak during open forum. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individual employees of the district or community during open forum. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. Um, so when you come up, we only have two board requests tonight. And when you come up uh, to the microphone, please give us your name and address. And being that there are only two, uh, we'll give each of you three minutes to uh, Talk to us about your concerns. We'll start with Chris Woodard, and we'll follow with John DeTay. Good evening. Chris Woodard, 227 West Lombard, Davenport, Iowa, in the central city. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank all the board members for your public service uh, this year and over the years, and for Superintendent Tate for all you've done for the Denport schools and the funding situation at the state level and the local level. My concern is um, about the closing of so many of the Central City schools. I was brought up in the Denport school system, attended um, local junior highs in Davenport Central. And at that time, I think Central might have been the largest high school in the state, if not close to that. And we had excellent education, not only as education, but social education. Um, if you get together with classmates across the years, the thing that they like to remember the most is the diversity of the neighborhood, of the economics, of the entire experience at Central High School. I've been... Um, proactive in city government as well. And I've brought up several um, issues to the council concerning my concerns that the Davenport Community Schools and the city council seem to be going in opposite directions. Um, as a past counselor in the Davenport School, school District, it's a no-brainer that public education is um, <clears throat> the corner, cornerstone of the city's infrastructure and its potential future. And all of those elementary schools that fed into JB, that fed into Central, are almost distinct, with the exception of perhaps two. And I realize it's done, it's over. What's concerning and frustrating to me as a resident, and I returned to the Central City when I moved back to Davenport because of my experiences um, in high school and the diversity that the central city um, uh, it's giving us is that the city is developing the multi-use uh, and the apartments and trying to get people down into the downtown and make that an active, vibrant area. 
and we're going to get people in their 20s, 30s down there, and eventually they're going to get married, have children, and hopefully move up the hill, and move up the hill to the central city. Where are they going to go? <laughs> I mean, people want to move where there are schools, where there are elementary schools that feed into other schools. And this has been a pet peeve. I just don't see where the Davenport school system is going with this. I don't see, I haven't heard of a long-term plan that is coordinated with the city's plans and goals uh, for the future of the inner city. And listening to the group that um, spoke before about, let's see, it was coordination, cooperation, collaboration, and communication. Those are the same things that I would like to see the Davenport School Board um, participate in with the city of Davenport. I really feel there needs to be a coordination in planning, a coordination in the future, the goals of what are we doing here with the central city? Are we going to let Genesis and Palmer and St. Ambrose and take over the center city to make it in, in Genesis? Or do we have a plan to um, support and initiate programs where young people with younger families can come back and fill in the center city? If you're not going to do that, if that's not part of your long-range goals, then I think that's something that should be discussed not only with the residents, but with the city officials as well. So my plea is for um, the school board to make more of an effort to visibly, um, publicly relate and communicate with the city of Davenport on your initiatives and future plans as you see it for the schools so that they can be coordinated with the rest of the city. So Good. thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next is John Detay. I wrote, I read, uh, I wore my red for Jackson Elementary, not knowing it was their color. Pink, I'll wear pink too. Um, and I have pink too, yeah. Um, John Detay, 1110 East High Street. Um, I, I also want to talk on the theme of what Chris was talking about, but I also want to thank you for posting the agenda um, on the boards. A lot of us don't bring our laptops and, and don't follow along um, exactly with, with how you're proceeding through the agenda. And I'm hoping that later on in the um, meeting you talk about either showing the attachments or downloading the attachments so that people can follow along um, in, in the public um, with what you're talking about. It's, it's really helpful. I'm able to do it on my laptop, but not everybody else is able to bring their laptops to the meetings. Um, in February 25th, 2017, the Quad City Times reported on your board meeting the night before, and Dr. Tate said enrollment is at the heart of the district's funding problem. It wasn't, it's not the per pupil funding um, problem, it's enrollment. And like Chris was suggesting, we, we really need to work as partners, as John Border is talking about, um, with Genesis, with St. Ambrose, with Palmer, with all those wonderful groups that are on our partnership list to find ways to use all of our creative resources on attracting people back into the city of Davenport. Um, there, are, there are large school districts that are just like ours in urban areas with the exact same per, per pupil funding formula, like Dallas Center, Ankeny, Johnston, North Polk, North Scott, Southeast Polk, Waterloo, Waukee, Sioux City, all of those school districts are exploding and have the exact same per pupil per form, uh, funding formula. We can do the same with, with putting all of our minds and hearts together. It's not entirely on the school district. There must be something that those cities are doing to attract people into not only their inner cities, but their cities in general. 
and and I know you meet with the city of Davenport on November 7th. I'm hoping that you'll make that a monthly meeting instead of a quarterly meeting. I hope you give yourselves, a, develop a strategy, a goal and milestones to reduce the, the, the decline um, in our enrollments and hopefully increase our enrollments eventually. Let's stop the bleeding at first and then find out ways to bring people back into the city. We're managing, and this is really harsh to say, with, with such a powerful presentation by Jackson um, and everyone wanting having goodwill, but it feels like we're managing extinction rather than managing distinction. And it's a hard reality, but there's a, a small group of people meeting all um, like online every day trying to figure out ways to work with the city on creating incentives for, work, for workforce housing, for get, getting the city to uh, transfer abandoned properties over to the city so that they can be developed. Um, there's, there's six points that we're looking at that will help the city um, reinvigorate the inner city, but we've got to stop closing the schools in the center city if we're gonna have any chance of bringing people back into the center city. I know you're, you're in the process of looking at another school in 2019 and 2020. Um, I, I hope that you'll work with all of us in the city of Davenport so that we can put that behind us and build rather than close. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and thank you, Chris and John, for sharing your thoughts uh, with the school board and with our whole community. It's really important. We appreciate you coming and sharing those with us. We'll move on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion? Mr. President. Director DeSalvo. I move that the board approve the consent agenda as written. Is there a second? Second. I want to point out that Director Gosa is with us uh, by phone, correct? Dan, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Okay, call for the vote. Director DeSalvo? Yes. Director Hayes? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. Director Mayfield? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion regarding bill approval of bills? Mr. President. Director Hayes. The following resolution is recommended by administration to adopt the bills from the billing listing periods from October 5th, 2017 through October 18, 2017. Resolve all claims presented to the board having been duly certified and correct by the secretary, reviewed by the administration and board members, and they are hereby audited as follow, as allowed, as just claims and warrants drawn on the treasury of the for the sub, for the treasury for the several amounts. Further resolve the payment of claims and salaries be approved as presented for the period October fifth, twenty seventeen through October eighteenth, twenty seventeen. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for vote, Director Hayes. Yes. Director DeSalvo. Yes. Director Fox. Yes. Director Beck. Yes. Director Mayfield. Yes. Director Gosa. Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Superintendent report. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. There is a, a media release today by the STEM Council uh, of the state of Iowa, and they have announced 19 what they call STEM best districts or high schools and our West High School is one of them. A STEM best is STEM businesses engaging students and teachers and those partnerships exemplify school business partnerships uniting what is taught and learned in K-12 mathematics, science, technology and engineering and it's a one-to-one -one match um, grant so we congratulate West High School. They continue to lead the way. Uh, last week, there was a um, media event where we announced that the Bechtel Trust has provided a challenge grant of 
$600,000, that's $200,000 for each of three years. And the city of Davenport had ma has matched that, so it's a total of $1.2 million spread over three years. And it's for two school research officers, which will allow us to have a presence in our intermediate and high schools and two community policing officers. This is a, a great deal. It will mean a lot to both the school district and the city. It's going to take about a year, though, before we select, train, and actually assign those officers. So <coughs> that completes my report. Okay. Thank you. Move on to other items requiring action. May I have a motion regarding approval of... Excuse me? Um, typically not. It's not a a discussion issue it's just a report that's being made okay um we have a motion regarding approval of contract unity point at home mr president director de salvo i move that the board approve the administration's recommendation for the contract with the mbaea to provide hearing interpreter services for students for the 2017-18 school year in the amount of $650,187.24. Thank you. Is there a second? We skip. Second. Well, it's, it was a different, different motion. Hmm. Are you reading from 10.01? I know that's why I was kind of mine is the approval of the contract unity point at home okay so your motion fortunately has not been seconded so yeah it does because if it was seconded it would be on the floor and we'd have to do something with it I'm going to ask you to um, Okay, so anyway. Well, I didn't hear it, so. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, Director DeSalvo, to rescind your original motion. Can you rescind it? I rescind my motion. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, may I have a motion regarding a 10.01 approval of contract unity point at home. Mr. Direc Pre Director Beck. <laughs> Mr. President. Director Beck. Um, now I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> In the recommended action. Oh, right. Um, I recommend, or I move uh, to, what do we say? I move that the board approve uh, the recommended action, uh, that the board approve the contract with Unity Point at home to provide skilled nursing services at the rate of $50 an hour. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? All right. I'll call for the vote. Director Beck. Yes. Director Hayes. Yes. Director Potts. Yes. Director Gosa. Yes. Director Mayfield. Yes. Director DeSalvo. Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We have a motion regarding approval of contract with Mississippi Bend Area Education Agency. <laughs> Director DeSalvo. <coughs> Mr. President. Mm -hmm. I move that the board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the contract with MBAEA to provide hearing interpreter services for students for the 2017-18 school year in the amount of $658,187.24. Thank you. Is there a second? Is there any discussion? All right. We'll call for the vote then. Uh, Director DeSalvo. Yes. Director Potts. Yes. Director Beck. Yes. Director Hayes. Yes. Director Mayfield. Yes. Director Gosa. Yes. And I abstain uh, because I'm on the AEA board and it just seems like a lot of money. So we'll move on to the, uh, oh, and the motion passes. Move on to 10.03, uh, approval of contract 
Recover Health of Iowa may have a motion. Mr. President. Director Hayes. I move the board approve the contract with Recover Health of Iowa to provide skilled nursing services at the rate of $54.68 per hour. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, if not... Hang on one minute. Okay, I'll call for the vote. Director Hayes? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. Director Mayfield? Yes. Director DeSalvo? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We have a motion regarding approval of the application to the SBRC for special education deficit 2017. Mr. President. Director DeSalvo. I move that the board approve the administration's recommendation for the request to the school budget review committee for allowable growth and supplemental aid in the amount of $3,416,492. The district will fund the allowable growth with cash reserve levy. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Well, I'm, I'm going to ask... Um, the administration and Marsha isn't here but oh I just that last comment in the note where um, the recommendation is to approve the request um, for supplemental aid in the amount of 3.4 million and the district will fund the allowable growth with cash reserve levy can you explain kind of mechanically how does all that work with the district Especially that that 3.4 million. Where's it coming from, and how are we paying for it? So um, I want to introduce first. I have Teresa Wesling with me, and Teresa is one of our finance specialists, and so she oversees all of the special education budget along with Marcia and myself. So I wanted to introduce her because she'll be a good resource for us tonight since Marcia's not here. So that's a very good question. So whenever we end up with a deficit. We're able to pull those funds from our cash reserve balance and then we'll go before the SBRC committee and request that money back and then that will come back into the district fund um, and will increase the um, spending authority that the district will then have to cover the costs of, of the deficit. And I just want to make sure because when Marcia discussed this a couple weeks ago, it isn't clear that the state will necessarily give us uh, the money that we request. It's just that they have so far. Is that right? There's no law saying they have to do it. There's no law that says they have to do it, but one um, piece of the law that um, is never in question is that for special education services, uh, we never can base services on a specific cost. We could never say we can't afford to do that if it's what is required by student IEPs. Uh, so uh, the state, to our knowledge, has never denied an SBRC request for a special education deficit balance. Um, simply because of the fact that these services are required by law to provide to students. They could. To our knowledge, we are unaware of that having ever occurred. And I understand. I'm just, I'm very uneasy with, with the state telling us we have to do something and at the same time saying, but we don't have to fund it. I don't like that at all. And that's a lot of money we're talking about. It is. So, mm -hmm. okay. That's all I had. Uh, Director DeSalvo. I think I asked this when we talked about it before, but is this amount pretty normal to what we've seen in prior years? I mean, that's a big deficit. 
This is probably our highest deficit that we've had, and we attribute it to two things that occurred this past year. Uh, the first one is that uh, last school year, the 16-17 school year, was the first time that as a district we funded the special education supplemental stipends for special education teachers, and so that was one of the big contributors to the deficit. The second reason is that we had to add a number of programs to our district, which required a lot of staffing. Um, uh, for special ed programs that we have within the district. And so those two factors are what really threw us into this uh, size of a deficit. So is it, I hate to even say, use this in the same sentence, but is it safe to say this is more significant than we've previously seen? It is. Um, again, uh, last year I believe it was at 1.4 or so, 1.4 million or so. Um, and so this was the first year, again, uh, when we talked about it, what caused this substantial deficit, uh, we really looked at everything and determined that it was the special education stipend that we uh, provided to staff, and then the fact that we had to add a number of, of special education programs to support students. Are those programs required? Are they making us? They are required. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, Director Mayfield. Some of these services definitely have to be offered to the students. What is our return on them as far as the improvement of those students' ability? And that might be too much to talk about right sure. now. Sure. Uh, I think every time we invest mm -hmm. large amounts of money, we'd like to think that we're getting an educational return mm -hmm. in the sense that those kids are better served in order to get as close as they can to proficiency. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we're even measuring that at all. It's more about the service than it is about the results of that service. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that. It's sure. sort of a mixed question. When I ask that. Uh, well, there are, you've brought up a lot of really good points, so thank you for doing that. Um, in relation to uh, are, we, are we moving students towards proficiency, that is our ultimate goal. Um, it's one thing that we have to be clear in understanding is that the students who end up requiring special education services uh, require those services because they have a significant discrepancy from their peers um, and they have a great amount of need. Uh, you can see that by the previous contract that you just approved for hearing interpreters. That's a substantial amount of money for a very few number of students, but again it's based on whatever a student needs. That was based on 12 students, the need of 12 students. So uh, when we look at whatever their needs are, uh, it, it's important to remember that it goes beyond just proficiency. Our goal is, of course, always to move towards um, our students becoming proficient. But for many students, it's beyond just the academic piece. It's also uh, related to their social skills and their ability to navigate their environment successfully. Um, it's their ability to be able to have access to their educational environment. Um, there are many disability categories for why students are entitled for special ed. Uh, academics is, of course, one of the crucial pieces that we are constantly working on. And sometimes we don't see the rate of gains with kids that we would like to because we're, we're, we're trying to fill a huge gap. And that takes a lot of time uh, to do that. But what I will tell you anecdotally is we have a lot of success stories with our students who are on IEPs. And um, you can't always recognize it in the numbers, uh, but you can see it in the... Um, hallways of our schools when they're becoming integrated into general education courses um, or how they do uh, with um, um, their overall IEP goals. So lots of times we'll see a lot of improvement based on IEP goals which doesn't always correlate to um, necessarily reaching that proficiency or getting to that proficiency as quickly as we would like to see. Like it, if I may. I guess what brings me to that point that we have such overrepresentation of some groups. Mm -hmm. And so when I say how efficient are we, does that lower those numbers of those groups that are overrepresented in special education? Not necessarily am I looking for, uh, should I say, meeting proficiency at the top level. Sure. But lowering those numbers, you would like to think that we're becoming more efficient at what we're doing mm -hmm. in order that those groups that are overrepresented are lower total. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would be looking for. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. We have uh, definitely black males we know are overrepresented in that area. So are we having some effect on those groups that are overrepresented? 
that's really where I'm looking. Not sure. Not are they proving proficient at the top level, mm -hmm. but being integrated back into the uh, regular classroom and being able to function. That's a great question. I will tell you, um, through the special ed data collection systems for the for what the state collects and for what the federal government uh, collects, we have not been cited for overrepresentation of any particular group. Um, we have been cited for uh, by um, ethnicity or race. Um, the citation that we most recently experienced was for suspensions of a certain subgroup, but we've not been cited for overrepresentation of students identified within special education within any specific subgroup yet. And I hope we're not, but we know for ourselves in the information that there is some overrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked that sure. question. Sure. Nope. So good much questions. That it needs to be proficient right now. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good questions. Thank you. Anybody else? Director DeSalvo. It's, it's not really a question, but I'm, I'm hope it's okay to request, but could we get follow up on this so that we know, you know, when the submission has been made and when the reimbursement comes and just so we know that how this turns out. Yep. I believe that Marsha will follow up and, and, and you folks will know when um, the district goes before the SBRC with this. Absolutely. Thank you. You bet. Director Beck. Sorry, um, the number of new programs you implemented, um, can you explain a little bit more? Sorry, it's my first year. Sure, the no problem. So uh, whenever we have, uh, with certain programs, that's a great question. With certain programs that we offer within the district, it's critical that we ensure that we maintain uh, a very low student to staff ratio because their needs are quite significant. And so this past year, um, our students, that require a great deal of support. Those numbers increase dramatically. And so for those programs that uh, require a very low student to staff ratio, we had to increase a number of those programs within the district. Exactly, yes, it was. Anything else? I've got uh, just a couple questions. So the <clears throat> You mentioned the stipend, and I've interpreted it as an incentive, but it's the same thing that we talked about, right? Yes. Um, okay. What it is is uh, we're required to provide special education services, and we're required to have certified special education teachers to provide those services. In the past, we've had an incredibly difficult challenge of trying to fill our special education uh, positions when school starts at the beginning of the school year. We're not, uh, we're not uh, allowed by the state to put substitute teachers within those positions until we're able to find certified special education teachers to fill them. The other issue that we run into over the years is that special education teachers in many cases, uh, once they get into a special education job, only stay in that job for a few years and then they move on to a different position. So we've ended up with lots of open special education positions. So with the uh, implementation of the stipend, we've seen dramatic decreases in positions not being filled. Uh, we've started the year with most of our positions filled with the exception of a very few. Feedback I've received from principals is that the stipend has been um, very uh, much appreciated in the ability to hire candidates that may be looking at two or three districts. Special ed teachers are a hot commodity and to find certified special ed teachers is a big deal. And so it's, it's, a, it's an incentive for administrators when they're looking to hire a special ed teacher, and those folks have also applied at any of our neighboring districts to be able to offer that incentive, which in many cases has been the impetus for those staff members to say, I'm going to start in Davenport, and I'm gonna work in Davenport instead of the other districts, because the other districts do not offer that. So it's been a huge incentive for us in being able to fill our special education positions in the district. And the other piece of it that we've uh, now seen is that teachers who are getting into the positions are not moving into other positions in many cases. That still occurs to a certain degree, but in many cases, teachers are now staying, which is consistency and continuity is crucial for our students. So it's been a huge benefit for us. And, and I understand and appreciate all that. Um, what I was wondering is whether this has been tested in the state, in the SBRC, the idea of a stipend because that increases the cost mm -hmm. of the the uh, supplemental aid that we're requesting 
And I thought it was a pretty significant stipend that we offered. But is the state going to say, yes, this is appropriate, and they're going to give us the money for that as well? So it, um, we, you know, this is our first year of requesting it. Uh, I would tell you that we will wait to see if they do flag that in our, in our budget that through the SES that's been submitted. But what I will tell you is that the state also has encouraged um, creative and innovative ways to hire hard to fill positions. And, and that has been a longstanding uh, thing on their um, BOEE, the Board of Educational Examiners website. Uh, that we have to get creative and innovative in trying to recruit hard to fill positions and teachers for those positions. I can't think of any um, thing that would be more creative in, in coming up with an opportunity to uh, pay our teachers uh, a stipend to encourage them to stay. By doing that, we have done much better uh, than many districts around us in getting our positions filled. And, and I understand that, but I know, I mean, the state is in a tough spot right now with money and if if this if they don't approve this and I don't know what portion of this request is the stipends but uh, then that would end up coming out of the general budget right general fund right okay um, just one last question the supplemental aid suggests that this is aid beyond the normal um, per pupil expenditure. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to do an equation here while you were telling us all this. I couldn't come up with the right equation, but can you tell me how many students are included in this, this total 3.4 million? So I can't specifically say per student. I can tell you that as a district we have approximately 2,600 students. Our count will be coming up um, at the end of this week actually, so I would have a more definitive number at that time. But approximate, we have approximately 2,600 students who are entitled and receive special education services. So they would be the supplemental piece of that. So that works out to, if, that's, if I did my math right, just rough calculations and you probably know if I'm right or not, it works out to an additional additional 13,000 over the 6,400 or whatever we get from the state. Does that sound right? Um, there is a, there's a, there's a weightedness formula. I, I, I know all that, but I mean okay. the dollar amount, forget about weighting sure. and all okay. that. Mm -hmm. Does it sound reasonable? I mean, that would be a ratio yes. of about three to one. If you averaged it, right. uh, I can tell you that we have uh, some programs where the dollars that are generated by the numbers of students served within the program, they generate about 50% of the actual dollars that are, that are allocated for that program to support it. Uh, so we have to look at it in a much different light. Depending on the level and the need of students, uh, those programs that have a much greater need require much more dollars to support them than the dollars that are generated. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, we'll call for the vote. Director DeSalvo. Yes. Director Hayes. Yes. Director Potts. Yes. Director Beck. Yes. Director Mayfield. Yes. Director Gosa. Yes. My vote is yes, motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, we have a motion on an approval to authorize the board president to sign a letter for historic tax credit. Mr. President. Director Hayes. I move the board authorize the board president to sign a letter of approval for levy development to apply for federal and state of Iowa historic tax credits to be applied to the 1606 Brady building upon sale. Thank you, is there a second? Is there any discussion? Director DeSalvo. Okay, so the buyer wants to obtain these credits and we have to approve them to get the credits for the historic building, am I understanding that right? Mr. Maloney. 
That is correct because only the owner of the property can uh, approve the application for these credits. So we're saying that Mr. Levy, the developer, is authorized to apply for certain state and federal tax credits um, on behalf of the district at this time. Those credits would accrue to uh, Newberry Development at the time of the closing of the sale of the building. Have we missed the boat? Like, should we have been getting, I mean? Well, we're not eligible to use the tax credits as we taxes, don't pay these yeah. taxes. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> so, we, so we didn't miss the boat. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? All right, call for the vote. Uh, let's see here. Director Hayes. Yes. Director Potts. Yes. Director Gosa. Yes. Director DeSalvo. Yes. Director Mayfield. Yes. Director Beck. Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Looks like we're done with our action items. We'll move on to uh, one discussion item that we have, which is providing paper copies of board agenda items for the public. And Director Hayes, you're going to uh, open the discussion. There was um, community requests for paper copies of the items that we see when we pull open our um, board docs to be able to look at exactly what we're seeing. However, in discussion, it was like we're saving money on board docs but are we wanting to spend that money in paper copies or is it better projected on the screens? And just to see what, you know, everyone thought about it. Director DeSalvo. I like the projection on the screen. I think that's good and it would, then we're not spending the money on the copies. Director Beck. I would second that. I mean, we're already paying for the electricity and we already have this set up. Um, so if we can find a feasible way to staff this, I know it's not necessarily feasible um, for Mary to do it, but it makes sense to me. And I know from being a member of the audience, it's a lot easier to follow along if you can see what's up here. And we have to give them that opportunity to not only see what's on the board and then disappear, but actually many would like to take it home with them so they can actually understand it, see it, know, inquire into it if they want to. On their own, of course, that's their time. Um, but I think when we don't give them that information, then we do not want the most informed public. I mean, many of the, much of this stuff is on um, internet already. Does everyone have a computer at home? Well, they're right here to see it. I mean, it's an easy opportunity to give it to them. I don't even know at the library that you can print stuff off uh, freely. Well, I think it's much easier to give it to them while they're here. I know uh, we want the public to support us. And I'm sorry, what did you say? I'm sorry. Um, don't people usually look at this online to figure out what meetings they're going to go to also? Or is this more for, you're thinking Not more people who just come regularly? Not necessarily does everyone look at it online. Okay. I'm a board member and I don't look at it online all the time. <laughs> so you could say it's available, it's my fault, but not everyone looks at it online. I know that, you know, I think sometimes we take what we do as ordinary, that all people do that. People have different lifestyles. Some people don't even have a computer in their house. Some people, even though they might be interested here, 
they're not going to walk all the way downtown to get a copy and walk back home and then come up here. I mean, it's just a convenience for your public. I mean, we're here for the public, I've always thought. And if it takes uh, a dollar more or, or ten dollars more a week in order to give that public more information, what are we really hurting if we want them to have the information and utilize it? Yes. I, I worry about the expense again, but I guess if someone in the audience would want a paper copy, we could get them something to take home with them. But I, I would I would not be in favor of having copies available because you don't know how many people are going to be here. We have a pretty big crowd tonight. Some nights we have like one person, and I'm afraid Mary would be running, you know, 20 copies and we'd be killing trees and spending money. So if, if I could make that recommendation that if somebody wants a particular item that we've talked about, we'll get you a copy, but we're trying to save money. So would that, would you object to, I mean, clearly there, that would be my recommendation. If we could, if someone wants something, we'll get you a copy. I think it's the same way when we want to speak, if people want copies, they could tell you at the door. Now, I understand, I'm not trying to give Mary more to do, but I'm saying to get around that, there are ways you can get around making XX copies if people want it. You see there's a large number of people here and they want copies. Possibly it could be done beforehand. But as you say, it takes time and someone has to do it. So I'm not trying to give Mary more to do when I say that. I'm more concerned that the public be well informed because it's their tax dollars we're talking about. And if they want to spend it on being informed, I think we should, we have an obligation to do that. Shane, did you have something to say? Or, yes, please. Well, uh, Director Mayfield, you commented something about how the public deserves to be informed. Um, I do agree with that, but isn't that up to the choice of the public to be informed or not, in a sense? Mayor, I think he's asked me, but I'm not sure if he's asking me that question. That's a question. You okay. Go ahead, <laughs> it was stated um, in the form of a question. I think, I think you're right if the public wants to be informed, but again, uh, I think some of us are take the what we assume is ordinary that everybody has that ability to do it. Meaning, I have a computer at home, all I gotta do is look at it. Now, we may get, be getting to that point. I mean, almost every kid has access to Chrome, I think, in Delport's school system. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, does every parent as well? No. So there are people that don't have that, that would love to have a paper copy. Um, whether you want to take care of all or just take care of those that are more privileged, they have opportunity to have a computer. And I, I don't say there's an ideal way of passing that information on. Um, but one of the things I suggested, if you started out with a base of five papers, that doesn't seem too expensive. If people want it more, there's some way that could be worked out. But to say none at all for anyone, because I think most people that come here would have some type of access to it. But do you want to take care of those few that don't? That's a, that's a, is it an economic thing now when we're talking five printouts that amount to about a dollar a meeting or, or $10? Okay, I'm not trying to to give put a price on it. I'm just saying it is not as expensive as we make it sound. Was that it? Well, yes, that's Madison. Um, I just had a couple of comments, if I may. Um, first of all, not everybody may have a computer, but I don't know anyone who doesn't have a cell phone, and I just pulled it up on my cell phone, and I can get the, a hold of the agenda. So. I understand what you're talking about. Not everyone is privileged, um, but if someone does not have a cell phone and they that desperately want to know the agenda after we're finished, um, they will find a way to get to a library or print it out at school or print it out at work. I, I don't understand having 
copies when we aren't 100% sure that all of those copies will be needed. And as a student in a school where every dollar counts, no matter how small, I feel that that money can be put to better use. Director Johansson. Thank you. I've got a couple of uh, thoughts. Um, one is the, you know, the issue of everybody not having a computer has been around for forever. And people have used that as an excuse to not move forward. We have, for a long time on this board, we didn't have computers because we said, well, we need those packets. And those packets that we got, I would gauge on the average, we're about an inch thick, maybe only seven eighths of an inch. It was a lot of work, a lot of work. The and and I would say that costs are important, and I think that the benefit of having a board packet, which we spent probably two years working on, on how do we, the board, move from these board packets to a computerized system. We had a committee that looked at it. It was very difficult even to get that through the board. I think that that um, Madison is right. As far as I can tell, everybody has a phone. Maybe not. Maybe there are people that don't. But, but I think for us to say on the chance that somebody doesn't have access to digital content, therefore we should make a bunch of printed copies and, and it would be a board packet. It would not just be this here. It would include every single document that is included in here as well. And I'm, I, it would be very, very difficult for me to support just having those available. Um, I, I, don't, I don't quite understand the logic there be, behind having printed copies. The other part, though, even having this, um, is I'm not sure who would manage it. I'm not sure, in fact, who's managing it tonight. You are. Um, and I don't know how difficult that is. We put a lot of burden on our board secretary. And, and trying to take minutes, which is an area we could we could discuss that and we could reduce the amount of minutes that we want our secretary to take if that's if we thought that it was more important to do this other thing um, and I don't want to get into that discussion right now but but there are things if we wanted to free up her time um, that we could probably do but I would say that our board secretary is challenged almost every day by the board needs by things that are going on and that adding another um, another activity that we've spent a lot of time getting rid of I would I would be very uh, challenged to support that so I think we need to think about this if this works and I don't know director Hayes you sounded like the question was one or the other um, I think this is nice, but I'm not sure that the board secretary should be the one that is uh, having to take care of it. And the papers, I just generally don't support that. Dr. Tate. I was going to say if the board wants to try to do this each meeting, that I would try to work it out somehow. I mean, we've got other people in here uh, besides Mary. I'm not sure what I can, but that's what I would like to try to do if, if you want me to look into that. Okay, thank you. Is that something that student board members may be interested in as well? <laughs> no. 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 Uh, <laughs> we have copies on, we have access to board docs. We have it all online pulled up in front of us. So even if you didn't have. The, to manage it. Oh, to manage it. Yeah, we could do that. It wouldn't be, if Mary didn't want to. Um, yeah. I know she's. A very busy woman she's on top of everything so that was some that that's totally a responsibility that we could take on um, yeah. okay so just a general consensus I think I'm hearing that we're okay with the projected versus 
the paper copies and if someone absolutely needed a paper copy that we could provide that. Is that correct? Would that be requested before or after? It would almost have to be afterwards. I think it would, it could be, or if, she, I, okay. So then that would pose another problem. How do we get that out if we're, Mary, then how would we do that? You, how would, I guess I'm kind of seeing that differently. If you do not have access to a computer, how would you know what you want prior to the meeting? You wouldn't know. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we'll have to work through the pr Director Johansson. The one thing uh, I was going to say is that I think we have a policy on. I think we have a policy on uh, costs, reasonable costs, if somebody wants us to make copies. And it's something that I just read about or heard about recently because, um, and I think it's, we offer some, especially like for FOIA requests and things like that. And we have had, I'll tell you, we've had some people do FOIA requests that require hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. And, and the way that um, the law has been interpreted is that a school district or a government organization is not supposed to be a copy center. And so there are legitimate, reasonable costs for copying and so part of this may go to the agenda or the policy committee but but I would be really really careful because I think I don't even know right now but I think our policy is probably like 10 cents a page or something like that and huh no but oh yeah that's right it's it's your responsibility so uh, anyway I I just think that it might be considered in that same policy where we, when people want us to do something, we have to be able to charge for that activity. And that's the way the policy is intended to be. In the, the uh, document that I was watching sh demonstrated that uh, the, I think it was the Iowa Supreme Court says that reasonable and customary is actually 50 cents a page because that is what the Supreme Court charges. Now that that's probably a little bit more than we would charge, but it's kind of up to the. Well, yeah, but but they're they're saying that it's it's that's a reasonable fee, and that's where organizations are going. Is that if the Supreme Court says that, then therefore, so. Anyway, just an idea. Well, it sounds like we have general consensus that for now that we'll try the overhead projection to see if that works for us. Thank you for your input. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to administrative reports. None tonight. Are there any board requests that haven't been turned in? I, I haven't seen any. Okay. Then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>